Good morning, everyone. Um, look, normally when I do pray over the tithes and offerings, um, I have something prepared. I prepare through the week, um, which I did do this week. But this morning, um, the Lord told me something different and he's given me another passage um, from the Word of God that it wouldn't be normally something that I'd look at um, in regards to tithes and offering. Anyway, um, what he said to me very early this morning was, I want you to um, read from John 3:16, And I know that passage very well. I've memorised it for a lot of years. And I'm thinking to myself, well, how does that relate to tithes and offerings? So what I will do, I will read the passage. And it's, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So if I break that down and um, try and pull it apart a bit, it says, for God so loved the world. So he doesn't just love a few of us, one or two, but he loved the whole world. He loves the whole world. That he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So because he loves all of us, um, his son was a gift to all of us. Um, so as we give, we're not just giving uh, for one or two people. We give to join network so the gospel of Jesus Christ can be preached throughout the world. It takes a lot to um, run the church and um, of course that comes at a cost. So I suppose the way that I'm looking at it today is that as I give, I'm helping. That's my small bit to be able to help the church. Um, and as we're here today, um, it's Deliverance Day. Um, it's part of our giving that we're here to help one another, to give to one another. So I just thank you this morning for being here. It's so nice to see everyone. It's so nice to see new faces. Um, and it's such a joy to be in the house of the Lord today. So Father God, I just want to thank you for this beautiful day, as we've already said. Um, Lord, we, we come to honour you and thank you. We love you so much, but we know that you love us so much more. Thank you for every single thing that we have, Lord God, because every good and perfect gift does come from above. So today we give you this day, Lord God, Lord, that your will be done in each of our lives. And we just thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ. Today, we honour you in this place, Lord God. We thank you. Thank you so much. Lord, today, we just ask that the peace of God be upon all of us in this place. In Jesus' name, amen.
welcome. Welcome this morning. Could we turn the sound down if that's okay? Thank you. Welcome everyone. Who's new this morning? We welcome all of you. Okay. Please come talk to me if you want to talk, but this is a special Q&A subject that we're talking about through the experience of dealing with people and helping them. This is very different than what you would probably see in church. We're planning these in the future times to expose the kingdom of Satan, yeah? Yes. That's what we've come to do. Not to preach a happy little message and you go home and you hunky-dory, right? We want to expose the powers of Satan. Yes. Why? So you can be free. Yes. Amen? Yes. So you don't run around like a mess. As they used to tell me when I was on drugs, but I'm not like that anymore because I found Christ. Amen? You see, the devil likes to label you and remind you of your shortcomings like he did me. I had a terrible nickname because of my days, but God gives you a new destiny and a new purpose. So why are we here? To expose the tactics and how the enemy works inside the family, causing division, causing chaos, causing torment, bondages that you can't explain, that psychiatrists can only medicate until you're blue in the face. Hello? Yes. But Jesus can get you off that. Yes. Amen? Amen? And we need psychology. We need psychiatry with God to work together. So if you've seen someone, keep going, but believe God will set you free from it. Amen? Amen. So we need our GPs. We need all these people. But there's no limit for the power of God. Yes. Amen? Okay, let me get seated. I got a bit excited there. Is that all right? That's my hitting Bible. So it's just, <laughs> this is my preaching Bible. And this is my translation Bible. <laughs> so you don't want to be hit with that one. That'll break your chest. <laughs> you know, we've got to get physical sometimes. Amen? So this is my brother Selwyn, welcome. You can see Hilton's a traditionalist with all the books. I'm a simplest. They told me in school I would never amount to anything. Well, I'm reading systematic theology, so I reject what they said. Amen? They said that I got ADD and I need to be on all sorts of pills. And uh, my dad said, no ways. Let's put him in sport. Let him kick and hit that ball till he's blue in the face. <laughs> hey, man. And that's what they did. They got me in sport. <laughs> but they were wrong because they didn't realize there was an academic on the inside of him. But all the teachers and everyone said, no, nah, but he proved them wrong. We're sitting between you as normal people. We're no different than you. We just understand that God can free you. And we put our hands up for God to use us. We're no different. We've made many mistakes. Been in drug addiction for nine years from the age of 13. And then I came out of it. Salwin as well. They called him Mulhead. They called me Pothead. <laughs> hey? I know I shouldn't bring this up, but it's relevant, isn't it? <laughs> uh, so whatever you're going through today, you might be labeled, people might say something about you, but that doesn't define you. Amen? And just on that point, <laughs> my parents, around that time when I was a teenager, my mother said that they actually thought there was something psychologically wrong with me. I couldn't string a sentence together. <laughs> I spoke in surf lingo, which was, yeah, sure, cool. That was my lingo. So we're both a miracle for sure. <laughs> and so... I if you sit in here today, you're welcome. doesn't matter who you are, where you're from. We love you and we want to help you. And if you come to this church, please accept people for who they are. Love on them, help them. You don't know people's past or what they're going through. We need to be there to help them. Yeah? We're talking on the subject today on soul bonds. Okay? Call it soul tie, we like soul bonds, because soul tie can be untied. But a soul bond is an attachment that only Christ can break by the power of Christ. And so what is a soul bond? Let's go to Genesis 2, chapter 24, quickly. 
I'm going to quickly start off by introducing what this is and we're going to work together. Uh, let's see if it will come up there. Genesis 2, 24. Okay, there it is. So it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So that's two souls becoming into one. Let's go to Samuel chapter 1 quickly. 1 Samuel chapter 18 verses 1. Is that it? Is it up there? Yeah. Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul, of jo the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own. So we see that soul bonds is a bond that can be formed on an emotional level between two people. Naturally you have relationship, but spiritually there's a spiritual bond between the two that Satan uses to keep you bound. We can take that scripture off if that's okay. So a soul bond is a spiritual bond that a lot of people don't recognize. Why are they struggling? Why are they repeating same behaviors? Why are they thinking a certain way? Why is it you're around a certain people and you keep getting entrapped into that situation? Why is it you keep getting attracted to abusive relationships? Why is it you can't break out of habits, behaviors? And so we think this is a part of life. But there's a spiritual element to it. So number one, God created a soul bond for unity, for love. But Satan uses it for destruction. He uses it to cause division, arguments, setbacks, bondage, and calamity in your life. Yeah? Yeah? We see this in Thessalonians 5.23, Apostle Paul said, You've been created body, spirit, and soul. You have a soul which is your emotions, your mind, your behavior, your will. Bit of crackling. And that's the place that Satan comes into your life. We all struggle emotionally, don't we? So when you're saved, your spirit man is alive. But it's the sole area that Satan works at. So five examples before Selwyn comes in. Number one, inherited soul, bond, soul bonds. Number two, friendship. Number three, sexual soul bonds. Number four, witchcraft. Number five, family soul bonds. These are areas of our lives where the devil can entrap us. Selwyn, welcome. Thank you. And just on the first note Hilton made, we... You know, this, we want this to be a family, feel a family, that no one ever feels um, ashamed of. Because between now and infinity, we're going to have people coming here. We, we get people, in fact, a couple from Bundaberg are driving down in a couple of weeks to come get ministry. So we want people to not feel ashamed of what they're getting freed of. And we just want you to know that whatever you deal with in our company we never look at it as a judgment to you. So that's our position, that we don't judge anybody. And what Hilton said is very true, because we've sat with so many people over the years, I've realized myself that I can't judge anybody. I actually just cannot, because you, you don't know what people have walked in in their lives. You cannot enter someone else's shoes. So everything is relevant, in my opinion, that one person's struggles may statistically seem more overpowering than another person, but to that person, that's their stronghold and that's their cross they've got to get through. So judgment is not that. So to build a little foundation, Hilton mentioned spirit, soul, and body. The spirit of the man, I'm just going to read this, Job 32 verse 8 says, But there is a spirit in man, and the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. So your spirit man... Uh, has your conscience in it. Your spirit has the ability of creativity, imagination, learning, making choices, growth, challenges, rulership. We are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. That's your spirit. And the spirit of the man is where Satan anchors the iniquities to. 
A lot of people think, no, it's the soul. All the bad stuff's in the soul. It's not actually. The iniquities are anchored to the spirit man. And therefore, you can get dictators like Adolf Hitler being incredibly creative and innovative. You know, if you have studied a bit of Nazi Germany, you understand they were actually evilly very innovative and creative. And what they did has extended into the world of satanic ritual abuse that came out of Nazi Germany. So that's the spirit of the man. So that's why it says there's therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ that are not walking according to the flesh, but are walking according to the spirit. So there's the struggle between the spirit and the soul. Soul, mind, will, and emotions. Therefore, when we minister to people, I often try and get answers out of them very quickly when we try to connect them with God and the Holy Spirit, because that will be your spirit knows instantly what the truth is. Your soul will have to work it out. So if you build your spirit man with the Word of God, your soul will automatically follow suit. So your soul, especially a child between one and eight years old, has nothing in their soul. It's an empty program. And everything it's seeing its parents do outside what's happening is recording everything in those first eight years, just recording. And then however that child is brought up will determine the decisions it makes later in life. So that's the understanding. The soul is programming. You are programmed that way. And some people have religious programming. The body is self-explanatory. Uh, it's often been said that the body keeps the score. So whatever's dysfunctional in your soul, your body will at some point manifest it. That's why often you see people, especially over 50 years old, the infirmities start to take effect in their bodies because all those years the soul has been broken down and it starts then to, the body's the last thing where it manifests. Some people are born with diseases because of ancestral things, but that's the point there. So if you want to just continue from there, Hilton. And give us the scientific proof that you wanted to talk about. Right. A little bit of touch on the science about this soul bond. Back in around 2007, I'm just not sure of my dates, but there was huge research on epigenetics. And I'm just going to read a quick, testimony of you, okay? An eight-year-old girl who received a heart transplant of a murdered teenage girl began having recurring vivid nightmares about the murder. Her mother arranged a consultation with a psychiatrist who after several sessions concluded that she was witnessing actual physical incidents. They decided to call the police who used the detailed descriptions of the murder, the time, the weapon, the place, the clothes he wore, what the little girl he killed had said to him, given by the little girl to find, and they convicted the man and imprisoned him. So yeah, you have a heart muscle that contained cellular memory that could disclose images, words, events, locations. So we have scientific research. On the epigenetic side, um, researchers call it ancestral ghosts or generational ancestral inheritance. That's how the science community describe it. So there is scientific proof what of what we're saying. And we call it a curse. We call it a curse. And so through epigenetics, when you're born, and people also don't understand this, less than 5% of diseases are mutations. They are simply inherited through the genes. The other 95%, I can't categorize all of it, but the majority of it is environmental, which means if you take two twins and you separate them between two different families and you get them to live in two different countries, and this research has been done, those children pick up the diseases of their adoptive parents. So that means the majority of this stuff is environmental. So, but then there's the proclivity of the ancestral inequities and curses that come through the bloodline. So the epigenetics means this. On your DNA sequence, on the DNA helix, there's a tag, a small, it looks like a hair follicle, and this is the epigene. And this gene, which comes in the form of a curse, can switch on or off genes. Mm. Example, the fear gene. If there's a curse in the bloodline, it has a legal right in your DNA to click on that fear gene or that sexual sin gene, or the murder gene. So that's the science behind it. And I just gave you a testimony, one quick short one. Another woman who had a liver transplant, uh, 27 years old. The donor was in his late 60s, who loved hamburgers. 
loved DIY projects, loved serving his community, and she started to develop all these desires. And when she met the donor's family, she discovered that he had had all these traits. So very important. And so maybe the Jehovah Witnesses are not too off the Richter scale, but I know Christians that have had blood transfusions and have just broken all the curses off it. Easily done. Continue. See, what, you, what Selwyn is saying there, scientifically is saying, is that sometimes your thoughts and things that you're thinking is not you. It's come through the bloodline. Anger, fear, anxiety, PTSD, all this kind of stuff. <laughs> Possibly, maybe you're struggling with the fear that you can't, you don't know where it's come from, but a certain crisis in your life has triggered that fear. So these feelings, these thoughts, these, these ways of making decisions in your life sometimes as inherited. And so that's why this is, we need to expose this. That's why the church needs to be ahead. The church is behind, friend. People in the occult are far advanced than the church. These people know what they're doing. They understand this. So it's time that the church starts to come above now and starts setting people free. Amen? Yeah. Yeah, on that point about Hilton saying the occult is so advanced, just in the area of uh, the New World Order, Illuminati and all that stuff, you know, when we work with ritual su survivors, we get to find out some stuff that you don't see in the media. And let me tell you, just on this point of stem cell research, what you see in what, we, what is shown to us in the world about stem cell research is just a fraction of what's actually going on in the illegal world. Let me tell you now, they are way advanced than us. But the church is catching up. We're going to catch up. We're going to pray for our brothers. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So we're going to touch now on case studies that we've dealt with independently. Is that yeah. what we're doing? Yeah. Very quickly. Mm -hmm. I'm going to teach you now through a case study on how these soul bonds affected this married couple. Okay, married couple with great struggles in the home. Now I'm going to talk about stuff that you're going to have to just accept it. <laughs> okay, you might not understand it. You might never have been, been ever taught this. Amen. You've got a husband and a wife married. The wife struggles with fear and anxiety because of the childhood abuse. In the case, this demon of Joker came up through the wife, which is a demon that is behind mocking and making fun of a person at their expense, making the person feel like they are a joke, not to be taken serious, always labeled as useless, and always putting the person down. That is the, the agenda of that power. So this person had the spirit because of what the, the parents had done. And so this person said to themselves, I'm useless. I'm a nobody. And it triggered that spirit to come into their life. So you've got to come into agreement. You've got to come into a valley agreement. So anyway, the case goes like this. Because this lady, Jill, suffered with feelings of insecurity and abandonment and felt like she was a joke all the time, the husband absorbed the soul part of the grandfather who cursed his son because he was rejected and he suffered with anger and resentment for woman. And just clarify, it was his bloodline, it his grandfather. It was his bloodline. So it was Sam's bloodline that absorbed the soul part of the grandfather in his lineage who had anger and rejection and a resentment towards woman. Right? This man, Sam, inherited all the feelings of that grandfather. Resentment towards woman, insecurity, rejection, and anger. So when married to this woman, that demon would cause that soul part in him to trigger her. So the resentment of this man, Sam, and the anger towards woman triggered her. Do you see how this works? Can I, I'm trying to explain. This is very hard to explain. Amen? We are seeing stuff that's happening in sessions that you can't explain. So yeah, you've got a young, beautiful married couple, couple not knowing what to do. 
And the husband says, I, I, these are not my feelings. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be like that towards my wife. It's just coming out. And so as we entered the session together, we dealt with all of this. Two weeks after that, all those symptoms were gone. As we drove out that demon of Joker, and we broke the soul bond of the grandfather that was living in the, grand, in the great-grandson. Yes, and let me just clarify explain, what explain. Hilton means by that part living. So Explain this. It's hard to explain. An ancestor does evil, okay? Murders someone. And he dies with the guilt. Let me read the scripture to you in Exodus 34 verse 7. It says, Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. If an ancestor commits murder, dies unrepentant with the guilt, the guilt transfers to the next generation and attaches through the epigenetics to the genes, hmm. and then starts to manifest itself. And then the demonic powers that are attached to that bloodline, because that grandfather, let's just use him as our template today, that grandfather that committed murder, there's a spirit of murder with it. So when the this, this person is conceived, that grandfather's soul part and all its unresolved emotional issues attached to the DNA, That's plus it. the demon of murder, and whatever other demons were under that demon's kingdom. Now, if you don't dismantle the soul tie, you won't get to the demons. And so often people will be trying to cast the demon out. It looks like it's going. They come back to us and those demons are still there. So that's what we're talking. What is this ancestral soul part? How does it manifest today if it's three, four generations ago? Cellular memory. And we've just proven by the heart transplant that the cells in the heart have cellular memory. They can reason, they have their own autonomy. In fact, and this is very hard to discuss, they have a separate form of consciousness. Yeah. Consciousness is not a new age term, it's a scientific term. And it means we're all sitting here, we're conscious. Spirit, soul and body, we are conscious. But ancestral iniquities also transfer as a form of separate consciousness. And you can maybe touch on this, Hilton. You, you know a lot about DRD. Dissociate identity disorder. Your brain has a, what it's called the hippocampus and the amygdala. And what those two parts of the brain do is when the first time you see motorbikes as a child, okay? The first time you ever see a motorbike, your hippocampus takes that image and that memory and files it in your brain. The next time you see motorbikes, the second time it takes that memory and it goes and puts it in that original file. So when you as a child, especially between one and eight, have a traumatic event because a child is not psychologically developed to the point where he can cope with trauma like an adult can. So what it does is the brain, the hippocampus can't manage this, so it creates a separate part in the brain. It stores it at the back of the brain in its own form of consciousness with its own belief system. So the person becomes a born-again Christian one day, and there's this part of them that just can't surrender to God because it's dissociated, it has its own belief system, and those lies have to be undone, renounced, and dismantled. So cellular memory comes with its own belief system. And a very vital point there is, like you said, why can't the person find the freedom? Because that personality that they've created by the trauma could be an angry, bitter child mm. because of what had happened. Mm. Do you understand? Yeah. So, yeah. so because that violation took place as a little person, there's now maybe anger towards the abuser, yes. and that has been locked away. Yes. And so now you come into Christ, but there's this part deep inside, and that's why we need to bring this healing. Mm. But the most fascinating case study with this couple was the husband said, the rejection, the anger, the resentment towards my wife, I do not want that. This was all inherited. Isn't that you end up acting out the behaviors. And, and here's another thing. Uh, ancestral generational inheritance works in two ways. You in, inherit it in the DNA. Here's an example. My, my wife, 
some of my family I would know this. She crosses her legs in a really weird way. Whenever she's reading a book I've or something. I've noticed that. Yeah, they've noticed <laughs> it. She, and I always just say, why do you do that? My son, he's three years old. He does exactly the same thing. Her father, when he watches TV, he watches like this. <laughs> My little boy does the same thing. He's never met his grandfather. That's DNA. Then you get curses manifesting in the form of learnt behavior. So the son sees the father beating the wife. He beats his wife. It's still a curse, but it's learnt curse. So there's two different forms of that. And there's an ancient one behind that. That's right. And so that's why... Often the enemy is wanting you to re-trigger that sin that's been so long ago. That's why the feelings to do that now. Because Satan wants to pin that ancient curse on a present day sin. So the feelings to do those things, the pressure, the compulsion to open that door, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so Hilton, Exodus 34 that I said that yeah. God visits, visits the iniquity of the generations because when, he, when those behaviors start to become a continuation and are perpetuated, then the Lord visits those iniquities. So you want to do your little... Okay, so I dealt with the case which is on YouTube, but I've e I edited it. I had to cut out some parts that were personal to the person. Um, but I was, what you didn't see on the video was I was actually struggling to cast these demons out. I was dealing with Baphomet, which is a, a demon that goes back in the Knights Templar, which was in this individual's bloodline, and having a lot of trouble trying to drive this demon out. And the Lord spoke to me and said, there's a, there's a soul part that's blocking this. So I said to the, to the woman as she was manifesting, I said, who, what ancestor is blocking this. And all of a sudden, this ancestral part came out, was the great-grandfather, his name was Giuseppe, uh, an Italian from back then. And her accent, I even wrote it on my video, listen to how the accent changes. When she started speaking, she actually, and she's Aussie, she started to speak in parts of Italian accent. So that was pretty profound, and we had to dismantle his sin, what he'd done, there was murder, and a lot of guilt, and he was very willing to let it go. Now, let's touch on this part, Hilton, because this is controversial. People see us getting that ancestral part to renounce its sin and to go to peace with God. I'll give you the honor of explaining that. I'll ask you the question, which, are you speaking to the dead? No. And what are you speaking to? Let's go back to the heart transplant. You're speaking to ancestral memory. Cellular memory. Yeah. And that's the curse of the act of the evil that gets mm. transferred down mm. by the demon that came through with the emotions, the feelings of that act gets inherited. So this person has feelings of anger, drawn to bloodthirsty movies. I'm just giving an example, horror movies, because of the bloodshed, because of the murder. And so the devil's trying to get him to repeat that door. And that was, yeah. that was the difficulties with this individual. They were drawn to murder movies and all that kind of stuff. So I didn't know that. I just knew by what we yeah, done. Yeah. So once yeah. we'd got that part, which I don't know, for some reason the Lord gives it a, a, a voice so you can communicate with it. But we, we got it to renounce its parts. I got it to lift all its curses off this woman and her future generations. And then we called up that Baphomet demon and it left. So it's just what we've learned through these sessions. So we want to expose. expose it. And today we're going to break soul ties. You know, maybe you're sitting today and there's feelings and emotions that you're trying to overcome. And you've been trying for years and years. What is it? So that's why we've got to teach this, you know. I'll give uh, one more testimony, yes. Hilton. Many years ago, we're dealing with a, a client and I actually knew their mother. And we were doing the deliverance one day and all of a sudden this person's actual mother's voice spoke through them. And I even addressed it and said, what are you doing here? This was the first time I'd ever encountered this. I was shocked. I was in that one. Hilton was in that session with me. We were like, what? This doesn't make sense. And again, we just were led by the Spirit. And, and because the, 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 the voice of the mother had said some nasty things about the person, so we knew what was operating. We got it just to renounce that. And again, that was the first time we had seen this victory. And today, all these years later, maybe a decade, we now finally are trying to teach on it. Yeah, and so it's a big thing to come out boldly and do this because a lot of people think this is crazy. But this is a very real thing. 
And for how many years have people say, well, I'm struggling with this thing, I can't get free? Yeah? yeah. The stuff is inherited. Yeah. Elton, do you want to read, uh, I don't know if you've got Genesis 34 verse yeah. 3 down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do it. In the Amplified. So it's time that we come out with it now and teach people why you might be struggling. Yeah? And we'll give you a solution of how to get free. Yes, Sal, do you So it's it? Genesis 34. Is it 1 yeah. to 3? 34, 1 to 3. 1 to 3. There it is up there. Now, Denia, Denia, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, went out un unescorted. Un What's that? Escorted. Escorted, sorry. To visit the girls of the land. When Shechem, the son of Hammer, the Hevite prince, of the land saw her he kidnapped her and lay intimately with her by force humbling and offending her but his soul longed for and clung to clung to see there clung to Dana, daughter of jacob and he loved the girl and spoke comfortably to her young heart's wishes clung so yes uh, we just want to try and point out how a soul bond actually works especially through sexual sins and we, a little bit a bit later we're going to explain the godly intent for soul bonds and the demonic intent so yeah you have this word clung hilton used the word clung clave in job 41 verse 17 it's the chapter that refers to leviathan and god's explaining this beast of the sea leviathan and he says there in job 41 verse 17 referring to his scales they are joined one to another. They stick together that they cannot be sundered. It means they cannot be separated. And that word joined and the verse Hilton read with clung are the same Hebrew word. And it means that it cannot be separated. So that's how bonded these things are. And Satan knows all about this stuff. I mean, in the church, we've always known about soul ties, haven't we? Yeah, break soul ties. There's those scriptures that people always quote that if you join a harlot, you become one flesh. Leave your mother and father. Cling to your wife. You shall become one flesh. And what Hilton read in Genesis about the man and the woman. Yeah. So it's a very real thing. So we have to be cautious too who you let in in your life. Who you befriending. Who you let in speak over you. Who you let in lay hands on you. Who you let in speak into your life. This is all very dangerous with, that, with no wisdom. You know how many times we've seen this. So we have to use wisdom in business. You can come in a bad soul partnership of a bond with the wrong business person. Mm. So we have to use wisdom who we're communicating with in this life. Amen? You go to a witch or you go to a clairvoyant. You become soul bond to that person. You open the door. Yeah, Yeah. I, ha I have a young lady I'm working with at the moment. She's in her early 20s and she went to a, a woman who does acupuncture. But um, I, I believe the woman was more than just someone who did acupuncture because a lot of, this is what I want, want to warn people and I hope a lot of people will watch this. People that work in those industries, fortune tellers, psychics, clairvoyants, acupuncture, kinesiology, uh, Raki, okay? I know a lot of people are going to get angry by me saying this, but I have the knowledge. Yeah. Lots of those people are witches. Because they have psychic gifts and abilities, so they go and earn money out of it. You can just see that in the book of Acts, when the woman with the spirit of divination, she was a slave to men that were using her, her psychic gift. So you have to be aware of this. When you go to those people, what they often do is they put a curse on the person to make them come back for more reading so they can earn more money. So people they go there innocently. I'll tell you what, the, the, the complications spiritually from people going to fortune tellers and that it's really extensive it actually fragments the soul i'll give you a quick story sorry hilton no carry on prayed for a woman and we were in this uh prayer session and i was saying lord uh, i just got this picture she told me she'd been to a fortune teller and the fortune teller gave her something and said go to a graveyard find a tombstone and put this, what I've given you, on the graveyard. And that will break the curse. Because she went there looking for help. Well, yeah, all these years later, I prayed. And she said to me, the name on the tombstone meant death. And when she broke that spirit of death, we actually, we actually literally felt something break. And that is a part of the person's soul that's captured in that location. The Bible says that worship the Lord with all your 
soul, yes, but with all your soul also. Heart, mind, soul. If parts of your soul are bonded to other people through soul bonds, yep. you can't worship the Lord with all your soul. Okay, and the soul is where the human will is. Just want to make that distinction. Spirit, intuition, conscience, creativity, innovativeness, soul, free will. Okay, so if the enemy can anchor iniquities to your spirit, man, he tries to get you from that way and then condition your soul so you can't worship the Lord your God with all your soul. What you've said is very important. When your soul has been attached to other things, mm. And, and here in, in Psalms 103, David says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. What does that mean? He's saying, hey, soul, you must not forget the benefits that God has for you. There needs to be something done there. I'm missing out on something. These yes. are the unsanctified parts of a man's life. Yes. And that's the part that you and God fight and wrestle for your will to choose him. That's the part that Satan doesn't want you to choose God because he holds that part captive, isn't it? Yeah, and what we're saying is that if, if you, you receive Christ and you've got all this stuff in your life, you receive Christ today, but you've got all this baggage here, you die today, you're going to heaven. Mm. We're not saying that this is going to keep you from going to eternity. What we're saying is this is relating to the working out of your salvation. And this is what we feel we call to is to help people with the working out of their salvation. So you've got your lifespan to undo all these things. It's the walk of faith. It's the That's walk what it of faith. is. So I often say to people, Hilton, you know, often yeah. people, especially that have come out of the occult, once they start the deliverance process, the <laughs> torment is incomprehensible. What do you say to people? And the devil does it because he wants them to quit. But, you know, it's the walk of faith. It's, it's very superficial to say that to people. Well, it's the walk of faith. And then they're saying, well, you don't know what I'm going through. But unfortunately, it is the walk of faith. You know, every person in this room has had to overcome things in their life. And let me just say this, your spirit man, that's where the drive comes from. Your yeah. soul will collapse because David said, oh soul, why art thou downcast? Your spirit man is where the drive comes from, that thing that's fighting for you because the Bible says, we always quote the scripture, the spirit of the man is the lamp of the Lord searching all the inner depths of his heart. What does a man know except the spirit of the man that is within him? Yeah. That's why when we minister, we always try and connect people's spirit man with God and often we'll say, what do you hear the Lord saying? Nothing, 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 nothing. Because they've learned to live through their soul. That's very important. Can you identify with this? And so when, when we say to read and pray, it's not to condemn, it's to strengthen our life so the, the areas of the enemy are weakened. Amen? You doing good? <laughs> what else would you like to do? Have you ever noticed a couple that's been married for 70 years? I had some neighbors like this. They've been married over 70 years and they weren't Christians. But the wife died, three months later the husband died. Have you often seen that? Let me read this to you. Genesis chapter 44 verse 30 says, and this is referring to Jacob and his son Benjamin. And the servants are saying this. Now therefore, when I come to you, your servant, my father, which is Jacob, and the lad is not with us, since his life is bound up in the lad's life. Mm. Let me read that again. Talking about Jacob and his son Benjamin. Let me just backtrack a bit. Remember the story of Joseph and Jacob loved him because he was the youngest and he made him a coat of many colors and then he lost him and then his soul clung to Benjamin because he was the next youngest. This is what this is referring to. I'll read it again. Now therefore when I come to your servant my father and the lad is not with us, because remember Joseph said bring Benjamin here, yeah? since his life is bound up in the lad's life, it will happen when he sees that the lad is not with us, he will die. So he has a soul bond and your, your connections with other people can actually cause things like that, depending on who you've bonded yourself to. And this is another very important subject. So how does Satan use soul bonds? We're going to talk about how does he use this because God uses it for unity, doesn't he? Yes. You know, it's to unify. Look at uh, David and Jonathan were knit together. They had a 
incredible relationship mm. that supported each other in a godly way. Yes. But so how does Satan use a soul bond in our life? So bonds are formed in different ways. They're either formed sexually or they form through friendships or bad partnerships. So Satan knows how powerful these things are because if he can bond you up with another controlling person, you, the person can't get free. You know, and what you often find is the dominant person, and often it's the spirit of Jezebel working through that person, has always got a group of people around them that are enslaved to that one person. And I've got to the point where I don't judge the person controlling everyone, which is, uh, as I've often said, they always label this person the Jezebel woman in the church, but that person's also in bondage. Yeah. We just need to have the strategy yeah. to recognize what needs to be done to dismantle that whole thing. But what I was saying is that people are enslaved to that individual. And that individual that's controlling everyone else has brokenness in their life where Jezebel has anchored into them so that they, she, that spirit can work through that person and enslave the others so that they cannot be free to worship God as they should. I think another point in, in the case that I studied, the, the marriage, mm. because of that soul bond, there was friction in the marriage like that. Mm. So Satan was trying to take a, an inherited soul part because there was a problem there and cause division in the marriage and ultimately cause a break. Yeah. But praise God, they came, they got set free, they got delivered, and all of that is gone. So the enemy will use soul bonds if you are married or business relationships or even your, your children or friends or whoever to cause discord, dis, uh, division, arguments, chaos, strife in the home pressures, stresses, that even not even one word has been spoken, but there's tension. Because the enemy is using that soul tie in the home. And Satan knows where the triggers are. For example, you mentioned the grandfather. Satan knows the grandfather's triggers that are working through the DNA. Yeah, so triggers. Can we touch on that, just how Satan uses triggers? Or do you want to move forward? Okay, I'll touch on that. Um... Or do you want to move forward? I just wanted to ask a question just to provoke everyone oh, here. thank you. I've got one, thanks. Thank you. Why did Solomon allow the worship of Baal and Asheroth to come into Israel? I want to put that question out there. Right, so Betty made a good point there. So God warned Solomon, said, do not join yourself with foreign women because the Canaanites, the Sidonians, all those people worshipped Baal. They worshipped Lucifer, and God wanted to preserve Israel because he knew. So when Solomon joined, I think he had 700 concubines or something. That's a lot of sultars. <laughs> and all those women who they'd been, he's tied to them too. So because their soul parts were in him, they were worshippers of, of Baal him, themselves. Solomon was lent towards allowing and compromise. In fact, this is a revelation I think I've just felt now. Maybe compromise comes out of these kind of things. What you said is important. So because of those soul bonds, he might have had interests mm. to worship these gods. Because it was their interest. Because it was their interest. So that's how soul bonds work. Mm. You might be, in a way, pushed in some way, interested or intrigued into something or react into something because of a soul bond. Mm. Yes. Yeah. So, Selwyn, what do we do with this knowledge? What do people do coming to church weekly? What does God's word say? What, what do we do? Well, the Bible says in Colossians, uh, Colossians 2 verse 2, referring to the body of Christ, the church, it says that, that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love, believers being soul bonded together, being knit together in love. That's the purpose of a godly soul bond, that we are knit together in love. I think there's a scripture in Ephesians that says, brethren, do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but rather love and serve one another. So godly bonds are only formed sexually through intimacy within the context of godly marriage and that covenant. That, that is to create the bond of unity. Yep. So with the body of Christ, we are knit together, but not out of control, manipulation, intimidation, domination, but out of love. And love doesn't judge. Well, that's how the, the, the Holy Spirit came at the day of Pentecost. It says that they were in one accord. That's right. They became knit together. That's why the church needs to come like this mm. 
in one accord, we'll see a mighty move of God. And that's why that happened. There was a unity, a, a soul attachment, so to speak. That's a powerful thing. Well, you mentioned what, what's Satan's purpose for soul ties and soul bonds. If God's given you a vision or you've had a dream and you know that you have this assignment that you're meant to achieve or, or bring to pass, what Satan will do is bond you so that you cannot achieve that. Mm. He will try to cause disunity in your relationships so that the vision doesn't come to pass. Because if you've got a dream yeah. and a vision, you need people. You know, like Hilton. Hilton's got a vision, but he needs people to work with him. But if there's disunity within whatever that group is, the vision will not come to pass. I want to explain something very quickly before we go to what to do with this. In the case that I dealt with, the grandfather said that he was useless to himself. Mm -hmm. He therefore said to his son, you are useless. His son said, I'm useless. And the third generation said, I'm useless. How? How did the great-grandson know that thought? See how this stuff works. It just comes through. And Hilton, the question is, okay, we go to church every day, every week. Why do we go through life and we'd never seem to pinpoint these things? Why is it? I think we, we're getting to a point where the Lord is really uncovering this stuff. Amen. We need to identify, when you work with ritual abuse survivors, you have to uncover the intolerable conflicts within the person because they've been so badly, richly abused for the first 13 years of their life. And you have to discover the intolerable conflicts within the person's soul. And, and so on a, on a milder version of that with us who haven't been richly abused, my, I'll start this by saying what should we do with this knowledge? And we can go from there. I think we need to ask God to show us where are the false beliefs inside of us correct that we're believing about ourselves first place because how can you love your neighbor as yourself if you don't love yourself you just mentioned three generations said i'm useless yeah so i think the first place is like that to go to god and say help me understand if this is you or not and yeah. start to do that because the person that i ministered just said they went on their knees and said lord this is not me expose it bring it to the light and all of this was erupted mm -hmm. So that's the first place, is to bring it to God. Say, Lord, these emotions, these behaviors that, that are overtaking me, Lord, can you expose it? Where does it come from? And then contact people like us and sit with us, and we'll lead you through prayers mm -hmm. to break these things. But God, in, in Galatians 5.1, this is what he says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So he's telling us, be careful you don't become bound to a bondage, to a yoke, to someone, to something. So what do we do with this? How can we... Elton, do you want to start with family boundaries? Yes. Because the... this is, uh, I'll let Hilton start on this. Um, this would be advice. Uh, I had a question once to a psychologist who was a Christian. And I was very fascinated by what is a secular psychologist what kind of advice would they give someone okay they don't believe in spiritual bondage deliverance and all this stuff but they do help people but i'm of the opinion that they help them maintain their life from week to week but they don't help them overcome it unless those that really tap into this stuff so my question was to the psychologist i said what advice do you give someone that is having these relational issues when they, some of them don't believe forgiveness is the key to overcoming that. And I was actually quite astounded. They said, we give them healthy boundaries. So let's just put our brain in a secular psychologist's shoes for a moment, because they do help people. They would look at the situation, not from a biblical worldview, but from a secular worldview, and they will just think, well, practically, how do we help this person? Okay, who are the problem people in your life? I've got three problem people that don't respect my boundaries. They don't respect me. Everyone's always abusing me. You know what I come to understand? This was me. I was always a victim all my life. Always got mocked, always got bullied, always got taken advantage of. I lost so many innovative ideas over the course of my life. Hilton can testify to that. At the end of the day, one day I had to actually accept that I was in fault. I had to repent to God for allowing all my godly ideas that he gave me 
being cast before the swine. And the day that I did that was the day I got free of this. And I started to put up healthy boundaries. And initially, the people that never respected those boundaries got very angry. <laughs> they didn't like it. <laughs> hey, <man. laughs> they didn't like it. And uh, Hilton will tell you, when, when Selwyn came out of passive mode, he went a little bit over the top. I'd, I discovered this new friend found standing up for myself and I became a little bit too yeah, aggro. I got worried. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, I've been, de I've been defeated Ahab. Now I can stand up for myself. And I started making the opposite problems. But once I'd settled down into my new life as Jehu, um, <laughs> I started to understand the balance between the both. So Hilton can mention this family boundaries. We often see this, especially in indigenous family communities. Oh. There, once something happens with the cousin, it affects the whole family. The whole family get pulled into the conflict. That is family soul bonds. So what I've done in the, in, in the past or even now is ministering to a person where there's a family that is all struggling. I'll say try to put some boundaries so you're not around those family members for a time. Get the healing, get the deliverance, get the freedom and then come back. Because while you're around these people, not their fault, the enemy's using their struggles to trigger your situation. So by putting a boundary there, you're protecting yourself to get the help you need. So you're not rejecting or condemning. You love them, you forgive them. All you're doing is, I need this time to get healed. Okay? So coming home as a married couple, husband and wife. When you come home and you want to discuss issues straight away, that could be a trigger. Yeah. So maybe come home, have tea for 40 minutes, mm. and change that dynamic. Mm. So put a boundary in place. We're not going to talk about the day we're going to have tea for 40 minutes, however long. That will immediately change the stress in the home. Yeah, for example, when your partner wakes up in the morning, don't flick them on Don't the challenge ear. them in those first 60 seconds. It's not a good idea. <laughs> So another important thing is keep healthy boundaries. You should understand what your spouse or husband's triggers are and respect that. You should know what your children get triggered by or how they trigger you. Respect that and put a boundary in place. Does that make sense? So what happened with me when I was in drug addiction, to come out of drugs, I had to put a boundary in place. I'm not going to be around those people now. I'm going to change my environment and put a boundary there, and I got free. But as long as you stay in that place, you're getting hammered. You're getting triggered. And then the devil's using it, the anger, the unforgiveness, the bitterness keeps rolling. Does that make sense? So it's not bad to put a boundary between you and a family member that's causing you hurt. Because the devil's using their issues to affect you. Does that make sense? Yes, and can I also say... If you Very hard to do. Yeah. If, I, if you identify these triggers in other, we're talking about families now, marriages, it doesn't mean because you've both recognized where you're both struggling, it doesn't mean bad behavior is acceptable. Correct. It doesn't mean because I struggle with fear, I've got to control everything because I have a fear problem. And therefore, out of that comes abuse. That doesn't mean that bad behavior is acceptable, right? So there has to be compromise. And, and, and you know, if you're with somebody who struggles with fear, let's use fear, for example, because it's very common, you'll probably find that they want to control their environment. And they don't like spontaneity. Mm. People that struggle with fear hate people that are spontaneous. So as the spontaneous person, you're going to have to just pull back a little bit for a period of time and just have a little bit of order. You know, I'm the kind of person that I'll just act on a whim and it drives my wife insane because she's, she's a mechanical engineer and she's very organized. And once I mess that little routine up, she gets mad, but rightly so. So there has to be compromise between husband and wife. Well, the same as me, I'll just make a decision and run with it. And if it fails, it fails, I'll deal with it. If I win, awesome. Okay, but my wife thinks about it. But now I learn before I go ahead, I say, what do you think? So I put a boundary before rushing ahead and hitting myself all over the place. So what do you think? Do you think this is a good idea? So that's a boundary I put in place. Instead of not telling her, running ahead, and she says, I told you. 
I told you. And by the way, you can't implement that and say, okay, darling, what do you think of this idea, this bombastic idea I've got? Yeah, you've got to twist it a And little then bit. she says, no, I don't think you do it. And then you go do it anyway. That doesn't help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so putting up boundaries. Um, next one is we don't wrestle flesh and blood. You must remember you're also dealing with spiritual things that are not flesh and blood here. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be wise. Pick your battles. Pick your battles because sometimes when people are struggling, there's a spiritual element to it that's working behind the natural and it's causing you to get into fights. So you need to recognize you're dealing with spirit powers. This is not flesh and blood. So that's number two. Very important. You are not dealing flesh and blood. And remember, the devil wants to entice you in arguments. Is that right? Yeah, because it gets you. You can't spend time with God when you're stressed and provoked in those situations. The, Satan's number one agenda is to disconnect you from God. And yeah. that's what saddens me is working with a lot of Christians. So many are disconnected with God. They are in the Christian culture. They go to church. They're Christians. They believe in Jesus. But they're actually disconnected from God. That's right. Often I'll spend time in sessions with people. You know, often what we deal with when people we know are demonized because their, their history says it's more than likely, and then you get no manifestations initially, but you know they're there. Mm. And then you get other people that come and it's all go immediately because they're ready. Yeah. Some people are not ready for deliverance. And we've got to the point where we've learned through experience that we don't push people. Yeah. We can see. We can see where the person's at. And we don't judge them and say, oh, yeah, you're not living a good Christian life. We say to ourselves, okay, now we can put our second system in place. Now we're going to give you some scripture readings. We're going to say, have some consistency in your church life. And bring their spirit man. So my strategy is to build the spirit man of the individual so that the flesh gets pushed down a little and you'll be surprised. Six months later, those demons are coming up screaming. And so that's where Satan has also bound people. You can sit under a doctrine every week. If it's not exposing the enemy, the enemy doesn't mind. I'm not saying those messages are irrelevant. They are relevant. But I think we need something a bit deeper. And what you said is important. The person's not ready. Why did... The woman of divination, he, the, the, this is a good one. Yeah. You explain yeah. why well, they left her. Well, three days that woman followed Paul. And I've actually been thinking about this this morning because she was a slave to other men for her psychic gift. And I, the Lord spoke to me on this. I believe I had a revelation. I thought, did Paul tolerate her for three days because he was inexperienced? He, didn't, he lacked authority? No, he, this guy was casting out demons mm. wherever he went. Sick people were getting healed. Mm. But he had wisdom. This is what we're learning through experience. We're starting to use wisdom now. We're not putting one template on every person because we're all fearfully and wonderfully made. And that's another thing. Everyone is intricately different. We are a fingerprint. Every person is so unique, you know. But going back to this, what was I supposed to say? The divination, why right. he left it for three days. I think he allowed her to listen to his preaching for three days, see the miracles, see other people get delivered. And when it came to that third day, I think the Holy Spirit said, okay, Paul, it's time to drive that thing out now. She was ready. If he just went to her that first moment Might he saw her, ready. she wasn't ready. She was operating in a psychic gift. She had to recognize this is the key. You can be going to church all your life, and if you don't recognize yeah. the bondage, you won't get free. God will not surpass your free will. And if Satan can bind up your free will, then he's locked you in. But the right teachings and the right messages that are accessible everywhere can That's help that. Very important what Sel said. The person has to be ready, mm. like he mm. just said. And so often people think this drive-through session of deliverance is going to fix it all. But they're actually not ready spiritually. They're not ready to surrender. They're not ready for these powers to come out. Uh, I, I dealt with a, a certain person the first time, and I knew it was full of demons. Nothing came. Sent them to counseling for three or four sessions. And after that, they started manifesting. Because the person needed to submit to Christ, change some strongholds, overcome some sins, uh, make some boundaries in their life, and start to make some changes so the enemy could come out. Amen? So the last, the last two years is very important, dealing with boundaries now, Having, in Jude 1.22, having compassion with distinction. 
So sometimes you need to use wisdom when you're around people mm. by having compassion with distinction. And what that means is, you know, us Christians, we just want to help no matter who it is. But we have to use wisdom. And sometimes you can only help certain people however much they need the help or want it. You can't force it. So put that boundary in place with family members that you know need help. And maybe you're unable to help them now. So you have compassion with distinction and pray about it. Amen. Do you want to touch yeah, on Yeah, I find it very difficult sometimes ministering to people that are actually living within proximity of their abusers. You know, often, uh, again, ritual abuse survivors in some situation, one situation, the woman was living with her father who was the one who ritually abused her. And I said to her, look, and, and she was in a situation of poverty. She couldn't work because of all the psychological fallout of what had happened. And I said, a sad thing to say, I said, I, I don't think I can help you if you're living with your abuser. So actually what's interesting, a year later, she contacted me and said, I've, I've, I'm in my own place now. She, she got some people. Unfortunately, we, in that country, we, we don't have the network to help. Mm. But God is, was obviously working behind the scenes because we had prayed that the last time I'd seen her. And she's now in her own place and we're actually starting this week. So there's an example of what we're talking about. And also in a married situation, you know, sometimes our partners, uh, we get a lot of compassion because they're battling, but sometimes we need to pull back. So have distinction. Maybe your help is actually making it worse. So pull back a bit. Have compassion with distinction. Just leave it for a while. Don't enforce it. That kind of thing. Put a boundary there. Yeah, you don't have to be compassionate to every person. Yeah. That's not what the Bible requires us to do. I mean, did Jesus challenge the Pharisees? Did he set himself apart from men because he knew what was in man's heart? Yeah, he used distinction. He said, you guys are just following me for the food. So Jesus didn't <laughs> muck around. So this, I think this is the Jehu speaking in me because I used to help everybody. I think if I don't help this person, God's going to judge me. Yeah. I've got to the point now where Hilton says we use distinction. And now what do we do, lastly, to conclude, if we have all these struggles, we, we, we're battling to control our behaviors, our emotions, we, we've been triggered, and uh, we can blame this one and blame that one, but we need to appreciate the fruits of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit. In Galatians 5.22, one of those gifts is self-control. Yes. You have to operate in the gifts of the a fruit of the Spirit. There's nine of them. Can we touch on that? Yeah, I just want to, and I'll touch on that. I just want to end for me tonight. Yeah. Today, I'm ending on this point. I want to just explain something to you about people that go through satanic ritual abuse, right? The purpose of the cult, okay? This is their number one goal for that individual. That the individual is chosen, usually within a family cultic bloodline and going back centuries, they will test kids in the family and pick the one with the, the, the greatest gifts, and that's the one they will pick to be the next to take over. Well, what the goal of the cult is, is to get that individual to murder by their own free will. So what they do is they abuse the person to dissociate. So they create dissociated parts and try and get the dissociated parts to commit the murder. And you know, there's interesting, this book I've just read, this woman went through the most horrendous kind of ritual abuse for many years and refused to murder. Despite all that they did, mm. her core identity, the spirit of the man, the Neshama, didn't want to murder. So that's their, their goal. So I want to just say something to you. For a ritual abuse survivor to get freedom, ultimate freedom, they have to acknowledge the evil that they did. Even though the executioner would hold the child's hand and do the execution with the child's hand to guide it. So to eventually bring it to the point where it does it itself. That's their goal. You have to get the survivor to acknowledge that they did evil too. For them to get freedom. They have to uh, take responsibility for their role in it. Do you, does that make sense? Yeah, that's self-control. Yeah. That's the element of self -control. Control. Yeah. Even though they were a victim, Hilton, yes. they have to acknowledge their role in the evil. So even at that high level, which we can talk, it's deep, creating that part to commit the murder, there's even an element of self-control and will there. Yes. 
So when you say the devil made me do it, it's right. incorrect. You can't say that. You can't the, say that. The core identity and the cults know this. They know that the person ultimately has the choice at the end of the day, despite how much polyfragmentation, multiplicity has gone on psychologically in their brain, and they've done everything in their power as a cult to procure this person to murder on his own because that qualifies that individual to be the next grand high witch. So the free will goes beyond all that. Let me tell you, God has created us so mind-blowing. He outthought Satan before time began. He knew what Satan and all the stuff was going to do. I'm telling you now, we serve an incredibly powerful God. Amen. And there's no cult, there's no new world order, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Amen. So we're going to close now and pray. Do you want to take any questions or not? Yeah, why not a would couple? You, would you like? Okay. A few questions. Who would like to ask? I'll let Sal answer these. Who would like to ask a question? If you put your hand up, I'll bring the microphone. Thanks, Elton. Since uh, this is from a Christian perspective, of course, we're spirit, soul, and body, triune, made in God's image. Um, I believe God looks at us through our spirit. We tend to look at God through our body, then soul, then spirit. Um, I'm just wondering that when scripture says, my children have been lost through lack of knowledge, that's a lack of God's knowledge of who they are in Christ. Then the other things are, we're told to die daily, pick up your cross, putting to, putting to death the things of the flesh. Um, we're also told to work out our salvation with fear and trembling because God is in us working it out. We're told to renew the mind and bring it into submission to God's word. We're also told to take every thought captive as well. When we don't do these things as Christians, are we just being totally disobedient to God's word because it's all there, tells us how to live, how to relate, what, how to... Do we put on the full armour of God as a Christian? Do we do those things? And when we don't do them, are we just our own worst enemies? That's a long... Sal, can you do it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you just mentioned some of the points in our instructional manual, the Bible. It definitely lays out everything we need to survive and to grow as Christians. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So all the tools are there. So, yeah, I think it would equate to disobedience to his word. I mean, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me, you know? And he said to the, the people, you know, uh, observe what the Pharisees tell you to observe, but don't do as they do. Um, so to answer your question, I think it comes down to there's therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but walk according to the spirit. And it, it takes a lot of work to get the spirit man to be in control of everything. And, and as we're living in the Laodicean church, it's making it increasingly more difficult. And it's making it difficult because the media, the news, uh, cartoons, schools, institutions, everything is pointing us towards emotion. How do you feel emotionally? Okay? Um, that's the but what, what, what you're saying is, is very true by living in the spirit. We've got to live through the spirit, man. Walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. So all the soul stuff... Yes, we've got to reject that and follow God's ways, and we will come through it. Yeah. And yeah. another example, yeah. um, Roger, I love Led Zeppelin. I love Foreigner. I loved all these 80s bands. I'm such an 80s. If I hear it on the radio, I'm like, I'm in, go back to my teenage years. But recently, I can't listen to that stuff anymore. Amen. Five years ago, I could. But as God has taken me higher up, and I'm not talking about ascension like they do in the occult, because we don't ascend like the ascended masters. We access God through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. But what I'm saying is as God promotes you spiritually, I found that I can't look at any of that stuff. I can't watch movies. Uh, I used to listen to Stairway to Heaven, let's say five years ago. 
And I'd be like, in bliss, you know, it's, the, the melody's amazing. But I listened, it came on YouTube recently without me choose selecting it. And the demonic presence that mm. came in my home, I had to put on some Hillsong music and just wash it out. So the priestly anointing is another thing. What defiles another Christian, what defiles you might not defile another Christian because that, that's where they're in their growth process. But that's exactly right what, what you've said. Mm. We need to walk in the Spirit and reject any other, someone else. Mrs. Sullivan, thanks for the question. Um, so when you mentioned um, acupuncture, kinesiology, all these alternate um, um, practices, what about the Christians? Like I've come, out, I've, I've been um, using all sorts of alternate health um, treatments for many, many years, and I've been on a deliverance and in a healing journey for many years as well. So, in that process, I've also then come across these what. I see as amazing Christian people that use these tools like bioresonance therapy, for example, where they, you know, or all kinesiology. I've got a very good friend of mine, amazing faith-filled um, Christian lady who connects with this Christian kinesiologist. So is it possible that Christian, faith-filled Christians, spirit-filled Christians can use some of these techniques or is it that they are being deceived and therefore deceiving us that are seeking help? Very good, Carol. Well, I believe these things are another gospel. And in 2 Timothy 4 verse 1, it says this, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. And what is sad is that the, all these things, when you research their origins, they all originate in the occult. And the other scary thing with all these things is the open portals. You understand the seven chakras. Uh, in fact, I ministered to a woman recently and uh, she was getting a lot of interference from witchcraft from the outside. She could actually feel witches, human parts projecting in and out of her, like uh, through an entrance and exit. And this was perplexing me for weeks. And eventually, when we got to the point, I said to the spirit, I said, how are these, because I would forbid them in the beginning of the session, I said, how are these things entering? It says through the solar, through the solar chakra. And in that moment, I said to her, do you have a belly button ring? And she said, yes, I do. So I said, can you take it off now without me seeing, of course? So she did. She removed it. We broke it. We cast the demon out. So um, what they do, these things, is they, they access your chakras. Now, you need to understand this, that the seven chakras were put there by God. They are energy centers in our body. I don't understand how it works. It's not new age. Satan just accesses it as an, as an entry point into people's energy energy systems. And when I say that, it's not a new age buzzword. It's just the way God's created us. God, Satan has just used the building blocks of life to counterfeit it and pervert it. So to answer your question, yes, I've seen, listened to these Christian yoga teachers and we've eliminated the bad stuff and it's just stretching. No, it's not just stretching. It's, unfortunately, I'd love to say to people, yeah, if they're not... Um, you know, celebrating its origins, then it's okay. I can't say that because Satan is subtle. And in these last days, unfortunately, everyone's compromising. So I, I think it's a false gospel. I would say to look at the history, find yes. out the origins yeah. and go from there. Yeah. And this is the thing that's happening when people can't get free, can't get mm, prayer, mm. can't get deliverance. We're searching. We don't know where to go because we can't get the help. We as the church should be the solution. Actually, Hilton brought up a good point there. Because the church, in generally speaking, has, for, has abandoned this area of ministry, um, people have searched alternate sources. That's my opinion. And so, and, and so then Satan's raised up Christians to, in a way, purify these occultic practices. Very simple. Go for deliverance and cast it out. Very simple. Last question. <laughs> okay, we've got two. Let's go. We, we're running late today, so we're going to... What are the seven chakras? Okay. You're right. Yeah. 
You got that one? Do you want to receive one more before we answer? You remember the first one? Just um, having gone through the process of um, repenting all soul ties and um, everything that I've spoken to Selwyn about all this stuff, if you have a, a child that... Um, can you just talk briefly about standing in for that child that is not following God? and Standing yeah, in the gap? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll just address Aphrodite first. Um, I had a couple contact me a few months ago and said, I don't know where they heard this, they said, I heard that you can do deliverance through the parents to free the, the son. In this situation, it was a son who was 28 years old. So I was like, no, I wonder where they heard that. But anyway, so I said to them, um, here's my suggestion. And, and the son was in... He claims to be an atheist and is very deep in death metal and all that. And so I thought, so I said to the lady, I said, I can't do that, but we can intercede on his behalf through yeah. prayer. And then I suggested a fast. Why don't you do some fasting? And then I said to them, because there's one particular, I don't want to give too much away, they might be watching this. There was one particular musician that he was into, even had a tattoo of him which is very satanic, and I said, why don't you go look at the lyrics, ask your son, what's your favorite song from this artist? Go and look at the lyrics, and take those lyrics, because your son will have developed his worldview based on this artist, if he has a tattoo, and construct your prayer in opposition to the lyrics of that song. That's what I said. So use that as template number one. Template number two, fast. And they'd said to me, well, you know, I don't know if my husband can fast because of this and that. So I said, anyway, it's how desperate are you to seem free? These are just tools. It doesn't mean this is a formula that can eradicate and do all that. But I do believe prayer can bring that guy to salvation. I really believe that. So th that's to answer your question. I think your prayers, you need to just have faith that you've said what you needed to say. You've prayed what you needed to pray. And now it's in God's hands. I remember someone saying, prophesying over me many years ago. I was praying for someone that was in error, and they just was, didn't want to stop that. And the prophet said to me that you can pray and fast all you want. And he prophesied, he said, God will do his very best to turn them around, but at the end of the day, it's their own free will. So it comes down to the free will of the person, just like I mentioned in ritual abuse survivors. At the end of the day, they can fracture them till the cows come home. Their core identity makes the final choice. I think you hit a good thing is that the prayer and the, and the supplication will, will allow God to do his very best. Exactly. And then the person will decide what to like do. Like what Hilton presented today, soul ties. He's the, you know, people are soul tied to that musician. We, when we deal with people come out of Mormonism, we break the soul tie with Joseph Smith. They are bonded to it because of the, the religious literature. If you are following a certain religious literature, you bond to the founder of that religion. And what does it do? Lead you to false doctrine. Exactly. And you guys know how many cults out there where there's been mass suicides, with the, they all killed themselves with a cult leader. How's that possible? Soul bond. So second question. Seven chakras. Yeah. So I'll just read them to you. The base of the spine. So what Kundalini does... And here's the scary thing about all of this, as Carol was mentioning about all these um, you know, alternate practices now. In the old days, it would take many years to develop enlightenment with kundalini, right? So it would begin at the base of the spine, and over many years of meditation, it slowly connects itself to the seven chakras and eventually to the crown chakra. And then you've reached full enlightenment, kundalini awakening, it's called. It's called the coiled serpent. So what Carol's talking about is that this has been accelerated in these days. You don't need to go through all that old process anymore. You can access it very quickly because it's so diverse now. There's this practice, there's this practice, and people are dabbling in everything. So the root chakra, you've got the sacral chakra of the belly button, uh, solar plexus chakra, heart chakra, throat chakra, third eye chakra, and crown chakra. So I don't understand it. I know God is behind the creation of our body. I just, I really don't understand it. I don't think it's important to focus too much on this whole 
Kundalini chakra thing, but we do come across it. Hilton's come across it too in deliverances. Uh, there's a lot of Kundalini is related to false Holy Spirit. It mimics the true Spirit of God and can be transferred through the laying on of hands. Example, sorry, I don't want to go on too much. If you've got a pastor running a church, right, and he's got error in his life. Let's say he has, just for example, he's got sexual sins. Nobody knows. If there's somebody in his leadership that are operating under the Kundalini and they lay hands on people, it can transfer. If the pastor is in right standing with God, and he's following God, he's a godly, righteous man, and someone in his leadership, for some reason, is operating under that spirit, I don't believe it can transfer. What happens at the head filters all the way down. If you're, the head is in sexual sins, and I won't mention institutions that we know has been in the news, we're not yet to pull people down. You, you know what I'm talking about. It filters all the way down, all the way across. So the man of God at the top is important, his relationship with God. And Amen. by their fruits you shall know them. Yes. Amen. <laughs> you want a question? Yeah, Betty. Is that like when the king was good and godly, his whole land was blessed? Is it that sort of a principle in the Old Testament? Like a family, you know, how far does that go with a father and family? I don't know. There's a scripture, Betty, that says, um, when a righteous king rules, the people rejoice, and when an evil king rules, the people groan. By righteousness exalts a nation. So yes, and it's sad what's happening in Australia. I think we're slowly losing this. Um, the, the institutions, actually the Lord spoke to me about the institutions, the Lord showed me that they're going to abandon all, everything that relates to God. So, so your, that's it, your government schools, your institutions... Uh, in fact, in South Africa now, they just had a big win. There was this big push against even Christian schools. They were trying to eliminate the teaching of Christianity. And my mom just texted us yesterday and said they won the case, which means it Amen. can remain. So prayer is possible, and I think we'll end there. Hold it, hold it. <laughs> so let's just close our eyes quickly. We're going to pray. And I'm going to lead you through a prayer. If we could just have a bit of background music there softly. And I'm just going to lead you through a prayer. And then Salwan's going to lead you through a, a soul tie break prayer. But I want to talk to you today that maybe you don't know who Jesus is. Uh, maybe you've lived away from Christ for a while and you're confused in your life and you don't know where to go. And maybe today's the time to decide, I actually think I want Christ in my life. And so maybe it's an opportunity for you as I lead you through a prayer. And there are three things that can give you peace to God. The first one is we have to recognize that we're not perfect. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. Not one of us are perfect. So we have to recognize that we have sinned. Number two, we have to repent of that, acknowledge that. Make a U-turn. Make a U-turn and turn your heart to Christ today. Maybe you've been living from Christ away from Him and today's a turning point. And you want to say, I want this power, this Jesus that rose from the dead. I want Him to rule my life. And number three, to have peace, we have to by faith receive and believe and confess that Christ died and rose from the dead. If that's you this morning, I'd like to pray with you. With every eye closed, if that's you this morning, I want to lead you through that prayer. Just as I was in that drug addiction for nine years and turned my life to Christ, He restored everything. If that's you today, I want to pray with you. I'm going to count to one. And I'm going to count to two. And three, is there anyone who can put your hand up today? I'll lead you to know Christ. Amen. Well, God bless all of you today. We're going to lead you through a prayer. If we could stand this morning and let's open our hearts to God as Selwyn leads us through a prayer and we minister to you. Selwyn.
Lord Jesus, we welcome your presence into this place. We enter your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise. We present our bodies to you as a living sacrifice. You are that wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, healer, physician, living water, who was poured out as a drink offering for the redemption of mankind. Lord God of creation, maker of all things in time and out of time, with all their respective durations and limitations. You are the King of creation. And Lord Jesus, you invented all realms, areas, spaces, expanses, stretches, areas, pathways, trade routes, inroads and outroads. You know every area of our life. And I pray, Lord, that you would access all the secret codes, passwords to our life, Father, and remove them from Satan's hands. I pray that you would confuse and scramble all the passwords, codes that Satan has had access to our emotions. Lord, all the ancestral elements that have driven us, that don't belong to us, but they are ancestral, Lord, we want to break that today. We thank you, Lord, that we are bought in, brought in, yes. called into the singularity Amen. of God. Father, for you are a triune being, and we are created in your image, spirit, soul, and body, three in one. So, Lord Jesus, we bless our spirit man. Yes, Lord. We ask you, spirit man, to rise up because the Bible says,